So um, welcome um, to today's webinar. My name is Anastasia Papas and I am the founder of the eAccess Forum. Today we're starting a new thematic sequence uh, on modeling frameworks for climate change uh, uh, mitigation policies. Our first speaker is Michael Barnett, who will present his research on how to incorporate climate change uncertainty in the design of economic policy. Mike is an assistant professor of finance at the Arizona State University, W.P. Carey School of Business. His research revolves around asset pricing, macroeconomics, climate change, and uncertainty. His work has been published in the Review of Financial Studies and the NBR Microeconomics Annual. Mike has a PhD in financial economics from the University of Chicago. But before I pass the floor to Mike, I would like to remind you to post your questions on the chat function and also to invite you to take uh, our short uh, survey. Okay. okay. Um, Are you ready for me? No, we're waiting okay. for people to respond to the survey. Gotcha. And a few more minutes, a few more seconds. And then... Uh, so maybe once we see the responses, you could discuss how they relate to your findings. Okay, so the first question is, which of the sources of climate-related uncertainty should concern economists the most? 57% answered all of the above, um, uh, but 26% answered uh, um, uh, the uncertainty over carbon and temperature dynamics. Um, for the second question, uh, from the point of view of a policymaker trying to optimize climate policy, which of these sources of uncertainty is of greater concern? 70% of you uh, answered that both the physical climate impact as well as the probability and the timing of advances in green technology are equally concerning. So, Michael, I think you're going to touch on both. Uh, this uh, question, so um, the floor is yours. Right. Okay, awesome. So thank you, uh, you know, first off for this invitation to present. I'm excited to sort of talk about my research, but more than that, get some thoughts and comments. And, and this poll is already quite interesting. Uh, you know, as the title says here, I'm gonna be talking about climate change uncertainty spillover in the macro economy. That's sort of broadly conceives what that macro economy means. Uh, and, and in reality, right, I'm going to be thinking about this problem from a very sort of finance and macroeconomic perspective. You know, I think the polls sort of it gets at the heart of what we want to understand is like what matters and why a lot of that is going to determine on the framework and the model. So I'm going to put down a framework and a modeling setup and, and sort of show you what the model tells us that we should be thinking about. And I think that's where it's sort of the open discussion begins about how do we address these questions? And in particular, how do we how do we think about uncertainty? So let me just dig right into that. The, the, the research question that we're interested in uh, is this idea of what are the potential consequences of climate change? Now, that's a very broad question. Uh, and I think there's a lot baked into that. The challenge and in, in, in where we start to dig in and think about our research agenda is the fact that, you know, the social cost of a climate externality is not internalized by individuals. And that's, so you have to think about this sort of social welfare problem where you've got an externality, it might not be totally in, sort of incorporated into markets, and that's important. 
Uh, you know, there are multiple sources of model uncertainty. Some of them were already mentioned. You've got the geoscientific uncertainties from temperature carbon cycles and the dynamics involved in that from the economic scenario, whether it's, uh, you know, climate damages or, or technology and, and, you know, and you have to think about endogenous equilibrium responses that complicate the policy implementation, right? We have thoughts and ideas, scenarios about what might happen, but the response to certain outcomes is something that's endogenous and, and important to consider. So what we want to do is explore uncertainty in a framework guided by dynamic decision theory. And, you know, I should mention this is joint work with my co-authors, Buzz Brock and Lars Hansen. Uh, I'm mainly focusing on a, on a paper that's uh, sort of forthcoming, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some newer stuff we've been doing as well. So, you know, we're going to explore uncertainty and these questions uh, in a framework guided by dynamic decision theory. So that's you know, we're going to evaluate the impact of uncertainty on policy outcomes, and then we want to identify the forms of uncertainty that, that are most co consequential. And that's not because of our ex-ante uh, assumptions, other than we put together what we think is a reasonable modeling framework, and then we let this dynamic decision theory identify for us and inform us about what, what matters most to the planner. And we'll talk about that, and we can think about what that means. So we're going to assess uh, the consequences of multiple uncertainty sources. We've got carbon climate dynamics. So this mapping of carbon emissions that are produced by burning fossil fuels into atmospheric carbon and then that into temperature changes. You've got economic damage functions, which depict the fraction of output reduced by changes in atmospheric temperature. And then we've got technological innovation that I'll talk a little bit about at the end that's going to introduce the possibility of a transition to a green carbon neutral economy through R&D investment, right? So all of these channels matter, and, and we want to think about why and when and, and how to deal with those when we're making optimal policy choices. We're going to characterize these components using uh, the following frameworks. We're going to use approximations and pulse experiments so that we can take really complex climate models and bake them into something that we find both tractable uh, as well as sort of physically sound, meaning that they sort of fit in line with the physical sciences and the geoscience uh, approximations of climate dynamics. And we're going to include ad hoc static damage functions that are going to have a stochastic arrival rate of their severity. So there's going to be some function that depends on temperature change and that's going to feed into economic consequences and how that matters. And in, you know, in the end, we're going to talk a little bit about innovations and costs and effectiveness of abatement technology. And and each one of these are stylized and each one of these are approximations because they are models. That's what they do. And so each one of these, we want to think about the uncertainty that's involved with them and, and, and sort of hopefully open the door to thinking about more rigorously these components in the future. Now, when I say uncertainty, I want to be clear about what we mean specifically. And there's multiple types of uncertainty. There's risk within models that's fairly familiar, right? Each model can have an explicit random impulse. You can think about Brownian motions um, and a continuous time framework and, and, and those variations where you, you know the distribution, but not necessarily the, the realization. And then uh, the two that are sort of more appealing to us because we think they need to be considered more are, are this idea of ambiguity across models. Where you've got multiple models giving rise to multiple stories. And you could think about that as say, you've got a, a framework with a, a specific climate sensitivity parameter and you've got maybe various values of that climate sensitivity parameter. And then there's misspecification that, you know, each model that I've talked about is just an abstraction, not intended to be a complete description. And, and there's some, you know, shortcomings in that that could matter quite a bit for the dynamic outcomes that we're interested in. Now, the models that we use in practice are, are, are both misspecified and amb ambiguous in terms of which of the models is best to use. And so rather than just knowing that's there, what we want to do is embrace it and confront it directly, right? We want to incorporate these alternative models rather than discard them or picking our favorite. And we want to use tools from dynamic decision theory to structure the analysis that we're doing. Now, the, the sort of the metric that we're going to use, the, the barometer of, of you know, how to measure the quantitative and, and, and qualitative impacts of uncertainty that we're thinking about are going to be baked into the social cost of carbon, this dollar value of an additional unit of carbon going into at the atmosphere 
that's going to be our measure. And what it does is it allows us to quantify and assess the impact of model uncertainty. Now, in our uncertainty analysis, we're going to think about the social cost of carbon as an asset price. And this is where, in our minds, the, the asset pricing and finance view of this is, is important, right? We think about carbon as a social cash flow where the impulse response from an increase in emissions to an impact on damages induced by future climate changes matters. And, and we're thinking about marginal changes here. And this cash flow, uh, we think is importantly discounted stochastically in ways that account for a broader perspective on uncertainty. It sort of abstracts from the sort of what's the discount rate uh, in the sense that the discount rate is endogenously determined by the states of nature that you're in and what's going on in the model realizations. And that's important for us. And we're gonna represent these uncertainty adjustments uh, as changes in probability distributions. Uh, so you could think about the expectation over future outcomes, how that matters for the valuation that you do and how that's altered or distorted because there is uncertainty about which model to use, the model being misspecified and adjustments being made to the distribution of outcomes because of that. So let me just dig right in now and start with the simplified climate dynamics that we're going to use in our model. Now, the geosciences has this nice approximation that's been suggested that simplifies model comparison quite a bit. Uh, sort of one of the first papers to think about this and highlight this is a paper by Damon Matthews and co-authors. Uh, and there's been others that have sort of gone through and replicated it, identified it, uh, confirmed this idea. Uh, and they've constructed purposefully this approximation uh, or summary of climate model outputs where you have temperature anomalies. So the change in pre-industrial and temperature from the pre-industrial level is approximately uh, a TCRE parameter. So this transient climate response to cumulative emissions you could think about this as a measure of climate sensitivity multiplied by cumulative emissions, right? So here we've got Y representing our temperature, F is our cumulative emissions, and there's this nice affine relationship that sort of in the longer term appears to hold quite nicely in approximating very complex climate models, right? Now, this framework is nice because what it does is it abstracts from transitory what I'll call weather fluctuations and thinks more about the longer term trends that underlie climate change, which is what we're really interested in. Okay? So emissions today have long lasting impacts on temperature. And in, in this framework, they're actually permanent. Uh, that we think is a pretty reasonable approximation based on the geoscientific work and, and sort of the, the decay rate of carbon in the atmosphere, at least when we're thinking about economic timescales and how that matters. Uh, and so these long lasting emissions have an impact on temperature uh, based on the TCRE, or sort of the CCR as it's also been called, this climate sensitivity measure. Now, you can already tell that, you know, what is that measure? That's precisely where we're going to start thinking about uh, some of the uncertainty components. So let's start first by putting this together. We're going to use some pulse experiments coming from the geosciences, both from Joseph co-authors and Joffrey and co-authors. And we're going to use these pulse experiments to build a set of climate sensitivity models for our analysis. Okay. Now, we've done this in a handful of ways. I'll show you what we've done, but this is sort of going to be very consistent with things that you'll see reported in the IPCC reports or reported by Damon Matthews and co-authors. But they're going to take these, we're going to take these carbon dynamic variations, uh, you know, and where they're reporting responses of atmospheric carbon concentration to emissions pulses of about 100 gigatons in the Joe's paper for several Earth system models. So they're going to run this pulse through the Earth system model and look at how emissions impact carbon concentration in the atmosphere. And then Joffrey has a framework where they look at temperature dynamics and variation and uncertainty, and they so show how, you know, there's this approximation of dynamics relating the log of atmospheric carbon concentration to future temperature using this sort of Arrhenius type framework. And we combine the sort of nine different atmospheric carbon responses from Jose and co-authors as inputs into 16 temperature dynamic approximations from the Joffrey framework. And that's going to give us about 144 different combinations, what we'll call 144 different models of climate sensitivity. And that's where the uncertainty shows up. So how does this play out? Well, here's what the combination of these pulse experiments looks like. So on the x-axis, we've got years. On the y-axis, we have degrees Celsius for the temperature response based on the emissions pulse. 
and we've got different percentiles. So the red shaded region is the envelope of all outcomes. The red uh, solid line is the 75th percentile. Green is the 25th percentile. And, and the blue dash line is the mean. And what you can see is that if you put a pulse of emissions in the atmosphere, these frameworks imply this sort of relatively quick buildup that decays maybe a little bit, but basically has this constant long-term impact where you've got you know, a pulse of emissions leading to a change in temperature, okay? Now, if you look at these outcomes implied by the 144 different models in a histogram, the climate sensitivity that we see plays out into this nice distribution of outcomes where you can see that the range in climate sensitivity ranges anywhere from about one to almost three degrees this being our sort of transient climate response to cumulative emissions parameter. So this is the uncertainty that we're realizing, looking across the carbon dynamics and temperature dynamic frameworks and looking at the combination of possible outcomes, we see that there's a pretty decent spread in how severe uh, climate change can be. And that's what we want to build into our framework and think about. And these are the models that we'll use. So that gives us one component of the model. The second component is going to be a stochastic model of damages. Now, again, we think this is a critically important component to consider because, again, there's a lot of uncertainty about how damages can be. So we're going to use a particular framework. And I think this is a framework that we think is reasonable and interesting and, and, and we think in line with what others are doing, but obviously something to think about in terms of is this the right model? So. We're going to use a piecewise log quadratic damage function. So what does that mean? Let n uh, be our uh, state variable representing climate damages, OK? And so it's going to be a function of the temperature anomaly, y. And, and the log damages are going to be represented by this function gamma. So you know, prior to some threshold, let's call it z of p, the dynamics of climate damages of log climate damages will be governed by this function gamma, which also has an additional uh, you know, stochastic component. And then after this threshold Z of P, there's gonna be some change to that damage function where this sort of allows for a flexible framework that if you wanna think about you know, threshold or, or tipping point type dynamics, we can, we can incorporate that into our framework, okay? And this gamma function, this log of damages, is going to have a, a linear component, gamma one times temperature plus quadratic component, so gamma two over two uh, times temperature squared, plus this threshold component, so gamma three m over two multiplied by this indicator function that once we heat, hit some threshold, let's call it y upper bar, that there'll be some additional curvature. Now, the uncertainty in this framework comes from a jump process. Uh, with M absorbing states, right, where the absorbing states are going to be different values of gamma 3M, okay? So after some thresholds hit, gamma 3M is realized, you understand that the damage function could be more severe or less severe than anticipated, and you move forward with those dynamics. Now, prior to each of the jump, the, prior to the jump taking place, you know, the value of gamma 3M has some prior probability, let's call it pi MP, and, but, you know, we have some waiting, we think it could be one outcome, but we don't know exactly what those true probabilities are or which one is going to be realized. And so we're going to impose a stochastic framework on this uh, where there's a jump intensity that this gamma 3M is realized based on a function, an intensity function that's increasing in temperature and localized over a region uh, Y lower bar and Y upper bar. So basically let's say from one and a half to two degrees, within that range, you could realize some type of tipping point or threshold that, that amplifies your climate damages. Now, a couple of things to note here, this framework, this sort of exponential quadratic function is actually uh, very much in line with the Nordhaus and, and Weitzman type damage functions. And actually you can sort of approximate those very closely uh, using specific parameter values in the range of values we'll consider, okay? So we think one, this sort of fits nicely with frameworks that have been used in other theoretical models. And two, what we think is really interesting here is that the information dynamics are in contrast to much of the previous research, right? Where you just specify a damage function and it's realized and known. And here there's this, or even in our previous work on, on uncertainty where you just sort of the uncertainty is never revealed and you never quite know, for example, what how severe gamma three could be. Here we're allowing for the realization that as things get bad enough, 
you could potentially re recognize how severe those damages could be. And we think that's important, that both there's uncertainty, but some potential for dynamic uh, variation. You could think about it as a very stylized uh, way of thinking about learning to keep it tractable. Okay, so what do the damage functions look like? I'll show you two different cases. Here, the x-axis is going to be the temperature anomaly, so somewhere between zero and three degrees is what the example shows. And on the y-axis is the proportional reduction in economic output. So, you know, as temperature increases, the reduction, you know, outputs at 100%, leave all the inputs the same, and that can very slowly diminish. Uh, but once you hit some threshold, let's say at two degrees, you realize this jump, right? This gamma 3M is realized. And so we're considering a spread and outcomes that could range in, you know, as you go from two to three degrees, you know, reductions and output that could be anywhere from, let's say, 15% to maybe like three or 4%, okay? This is quite a decent spread. The average is around five to 10% reduction after three degrees. That's a pretty big anomaly. And and you could have you know, quite sizable climate damages in this setting where you've realized the jump at two degrees. Now, what's interesting is that you know, we don't know exactly when this sort of jump realization will take place. So consider the alternative that rather than at two degrees, the jump realization takes place at one and a half degrees, right? And that's the anomaly over the pre-industrial level. So right now, we're a little over a one degree temperature anomaly. So within another half a degree in, in terms of global mean temperature increase, we could realize some threshold. And you know, if it takes place at this point, right, it realizes earlier, the impacts become more severe, and now damages in our framework could be much more significant, right? Ranging not from about you know, five to 15%, but now from about five to 30%. So, we're allowing for scenarios and settings where damages could be very minimal or damages from climate change could be very large. And we have to put prior probabilities and deal with the uncertainty about we don't know when these realizations will take place or how severe they can be. And here's our intensity function, just to sort of put it in picture form, right? We have zero probability of the arrival happening and the intensity rate of this jump increases starting at one and a half degree temperature anomaly and ramps up as we go towards two degrees, such that, you know, as we simulate the model outcomes, the probability of the jump taking place is, uh, is approaching one at about two degrees. Okay, so that gives us the climate scenario, that gives us the economic damages from climate change, and now we tie it all together by thinking about the economic piece of the model uh, that, you know, and linking our sort of production and preferences to the climate scenario that, or it's sort of the climate framework that I talked about previously, okay? Now, this is going to be uh, particularly stylized. I, I want to highlight that this framework isn't going to be a perfect quantitative framework. And in some sense, we're going to use this phrase of, of thinking about quantitative storytelling. Now, why? Well, because what we want is there's a couple of ways to approach this. You can approach it with a very complex, complicated model that's very difficult to solve and also very difficult to interpret. We've taken a different approach and we've thought about using a framework that we think is reasonable and tractable because we think it highlights very clearly the mechanisms of interest. Now, that being said, we think it's of significant interest to build on that and start to flesh out more and more of the economic framework. And I'll show you how we're doing that uh, later on. But you know, we think it's important both to have that tractability and real sort of reality of the framework and so we'll start with this tractable framework to highlight the mechanisms of interest. So we're going to have this per period uh, instantaneous contribution to preferences, our utility function here, is going to be this function of consumption. It's going to be reduced by damages. And there's an additional uh, preference component coming from emissions. So CT is consumption, ET are carbon emissions, and NT goes back to our climate damages. Delta is our subjective discount rate. We'll pick some value, and there's a lot of discussion about what this might be. But again, in our framework, because of the stochastic nature of how we're discounting outcomes, that's not going to be the be all end all. It's an important piece, but we think that adjusting that discounting based on the states of nature we're in is part of the important analysis that we're doing. And here, eta is uh, the importance of emission. You could think about this as the substitution. It's a Cobb Douglas substitution between consumption and, and emissions, consumption of the sort of non-emissions type and emissions uh, that's important. And we're sort of thinking about that as, 
uh, you know, emissions input into production outcomes that you would see in the macroeconomic data. So now the output generated that's uh, used for this CT consumption is coming from an AK type production model with adjustment costs. So there's a capital stock, there's some productivity uh, TFP parameter alpha, and the output is uh, shifted either between consumption or investment, where capital is evolving based on this adjustment cost fee uh, and some stochastic shocks, where W here is a Brownian motion and sigma is the volatility or, or sort of Brownian exposure of the capital stock. Now, another sort of simplification that we're going to use in our framework is that there's going to be this infinite supply of carbon emissions that are climate change inducing. Now you could, we've solved different frameworks and in, in, in our RFS paper, we have this stock, a limited stock of reserves where we allow for exploration. We found that the framework is very similar to just assuming that we have a very large amount of reserves, something sort of within the estimates of what's, uh, you know, with technological improvements, what can actually be uh, extracted. And the frameworks look quite similar. So this simplification mm -hmm. isn't going to be too bad. Uh, we think it's very tractable and not totally unreasonable to think that the amount of emissions that we have between natural gas, coal, and oil uh, is large enough that we're not going to sort of have to think about the limited supply in the very near future. So that's where we're thinking about this framework, okay? So now that gives us the framework in terms of, you know, the economy, the climate, and the, the damages involved. So let me dig into the, the uncertainty component. And that will allow me to then start to highlight some numerical results and where the uncertainty matters and talk about these different frameworks of interest to us. Okay. So first consider a very sort of standard uh, optimization setting, your sort of standard macroeconomic problem. I'm going to be solving a social planner's problem, maximizing lifetime expected utility. Okay. We'll describe the, all of the different states, which here are going to be Y for temperature anomaly, N is going to be our climate damages uh, and K is our capital stock. You know, those will be baked into this composite state equation where we're going to think about a continuous time framework. X here is going to be our, uh, our state vector. AT is our action vector. And the evolution of X depends on some drift, which can change with the state and action choices A volatility exposure. And here I'm introducing sort of just very generally a jump process that captures the, the shifts potentially in the damages uh, or, you know, when we go forward, technological change, okay? Again, W is the Brownian motion, N is our Poisson process, there's some filtration F uh, and sort of some regularity conditions to keep this all nice and clear, okay? So what comes out of this equation? Well, we get a planner's problem, which can be baked down to a very sort of standard HJB equation, right? Standard macro framework, standard sort of finance asset pricing framework, where you know, the value function here, V, sort of the welfare of the, that the social planner is thinking about depends on utility, the evolution, both in terms of drift, variance, and jumps of the state process, okay? Again, where U is the utility function and, and V is the value function. Okay, so I don't wanna get too much detail here, but we're starting from a very standard framework. But what do we think about uncertainty? Why does it matter? Well, we've already introduced one form of uncertainty in terms of risk with the Brownian motion and a jump process, but we want to go a step further and really confront the model uncertainty. And so to do that, we're going to introduce misspecification ambiguity aversion along the lines of Hansen and Sargent, Klibanoff and co-authors, Macaroni and co-authors, and Hansen and Miao. This very sort of canonical dynamic decision theory frameworks that have been built up and, and, and inform us in asset pricing uh, and other macro settings we're going to use here sort of at a broad level, what does this mean? We're going to introduce a two-player zero-sum differential game where one of the players is going to engage in your standard maximizing the social welfare, and the other player is going to optimize adverse consequences, okay? Now, you could just think about the very worst outcome that would lead to negative utility, right? We just assume that, you know, climate change impacts are going to be like infinitely negative, but that's not what we think is going to be the best way to think about this. So we're going to restrict or constrain this second player thinking about uncertainty using relative entropy. So some model of, uh, or some measure of model distance between what we think the model is and what the worst case models could be. And we're going to bound those with relative entropy and, and take that into account when we make decisions about what the worst case outcomes could be. 
So from this framework, we construct a worst case probability from a two player game and make uncertainty adjustments to the valuation. I think what's key here is not that we're saying the worst case model is what the planner believes to be the true model. What it's telling us is that the planner wants to consider what those potential misspecifications or, or amb ambiguous frameworks could be. And they wanna use those to inform their policy choices, confronting the uncertainty head on. So what does that do? Well, as I mentioned, it has a two player game. And so we introduce a second component, a minimization problem, which could be in the form of misspecification about the state dependent drift distortions. Here, this shows up as some distortion H where we have a relative entropy penalization uh, of a, a parameter CR multiplied by a quadratic uh, relative entropy adjustment. Or if we're thinking about ambiguity in terms of the prior density, think about the weightings on the damage functions or weightings on the climate sensitivity, it's an adjustment F which distorts the probability distribution on which models we're using. Again, with a relative entropy adjustment, or again, we can do the same thing when we're thinking about the jump process. Think here about the shift and the, the jump and the damage function. Again, with a G function, that's a distortion to the distribution, okay? We introduce preference parameters. Here, we're calling them XCA for ambiguity and XCR for robustness. Those govern the aversion to uncertainty. And the choice of those parameters is important. We're going to think about which parameter choices are reasonable. But critically, it's a max-min problem that we've introduced now that links the decision-making to the uncertainty outcomes. So which of the distortions, this H or F or G function matters, is an optimal choice that the planner here wants to think about. How do those show up? Well, they show up in the form of distortions uh, H star or, or F, which are these exponential dis distortions or adjustments to the probability functions of interest, okay? Why does that matter? Let me quickly talk about that and then I can get into some of these numerical results. Well, let's just look at the social cost of carbon and see where this shows up, okay? The social cost of carbon in our framework is just the marginal utility of emissions. So take that derivative of the utility function with respect to E and it's scaled by the marginal utility of consumption to put it in dollar terms, okay? Now, what does that look like? Well, on the left-hand side, you get just the change in the utility function, right? The marginal change. So this eta over E tilde here, where E is gonna be our optimal choice of E. And on the right-hand side, this is what's coming through the dynamics on the HJB equation. It's all of the drift and volatility adjustments. <clears throat> so the marginal utility of emissions is equal to this derivative of the value function with respect to temperature scaled by the the drift distortion or sorry the the drift of you know the dynamics and the the model and that's a direct temperature impact right think about this as a, a marginal increase in emission has a drift impact through the temperature and there's also an indirect effect coming through the marginal change in damages and the change in the drift of damages coming from an extra unit of emissions now this right hand side implicitly encodes expectations right the value function and the drifts depend on the expectations. And it's importantly, those uh, value function and distortion or drifts depend on the probabilities and the drift distortions or the probability distortions coming through the model uncertainty. And so when we think about the social cost of carbon, we can see from the right hand side of this expression that this is explicitly incorporating uncertainty and behaving very much like a forward looking asset price that thinks about future outcomes through the recursive value function and the distortions on the probability distribution that are flowing through here because of the model uncertainty, okay? So in a nutshell, that's why model uncertainty matters. It's influencing the forward-looking value function and the dynamics of the state or what we think the dynamics of the state might be as a social planner. Okay, so now let me dig into some of the, the, the quantitative results that we have, you know, Again, I call this quantitative storytelling because you know we want to put some numbers that we think are plausible and realistic. However, again, the model is simplified for tractability. And so these aren't going to be perfect approximations, that they're going to be what we think are quite reasonable and formative. Okay. So what do we have? We're going to have a framework that thinks about multiple climate models and damage models, 144 climate models and 20 different damage models, where this gamma three is going to range between a value of zero and one third. Okay. We've got multiple forms of model uncertainty, this misspecified jump process related to the, the climate damages, 
as well as ambiguity or different parameter values on the climate sensitivity, the TCRE. And then we'll think about varying magnitudes of uncertainty. So note here, I've got for ambiguity, some small number 0 0.0002 and infinity. What do those even mean? Well, infinity means that we have zero uncertainty. That's just taking a standard average over the potential models. And the smaller uh, numbers, the smaller the number gets, sort of the bigger we get in terms of uh, model uncertainty concerns. Now, I don't want you to look at this number and directly interpret this as anything meaningful. The only way to sort of really think about that is to look at either detection error probabilities or probability distortions or relative entropies. And so I'll show you the probability distortions to think about are these parameter values, which at face value are sort of difficult to interpret, are they reasonable? Do they make sense? Do we think they're reasonable to consider or not? Okay. And so from this framework, you know, we're going to match the rest of our parameters. We're trying to fit them to either climate uh, parameters, the economic literature or data to sort of square up all the values. And then I'm going to show you here some results for the optimal choices in terms of emissions or other choice values, some probability distortions and social costs of carbon. So here's the first outcome from this framework. Remember that histogram of TCRE parameters I showed you? That same histogram is shown here in red. So for the level of uncertainty that we're thinking about here, that XCA value going away from infinity towards that small, uh, you know, two to the e to the negative four here, we get this shift in the distribution. So what is uncertainty doing? Well, it's shifting from the left tail towards the right tail. But it's doing in a way that's sort of dynamically informative, right? It's sort of shifting based on the states of nature. And we think in a reasonable way. If you look at the distortion, we aren't putting a weight of 100% on the worst outcome. In fact, we're spreading out the, the, the probability weighting across the distribution, but tilting it more towards the tail. And that's informative, right? Clearly, the planner is worried about potential temperature changes that are larger. However, they're spreading it across potential realizations that go across the distribution because they don't know what the true outcome is. So that's the type of uncertainty we're thinking about and how it's shifting the climate dynamics or the concerns about what they might be. Now here, these are the uncertainty adjusted damage function probabilities for three different values, okay? So the red uh, histogram, the sort of equally weighted distribution is the, the gamma three parameters ranging from zero to 0.3 or 0.33, okay? Now these values start out equal weighted, but as we go from different parameter values, starting let's say at 0 0.01, moving up to you know, 0 0.005 and getting smaller, we see that the tilt in the distribution acts as we saw with the climate sensitivity. It moves from the left tail to the right tail. And the smaller we make that XC value, the larger this distortion gets. And so we can get quite large. And we might think this right panel, where we put pretty significant weight on the highest damage probability, could be too large. And maybe it's more interesting and, and, and reasonable to think about maybe this middle scenario or even the left scenario. Okay, So those are the types of uh, frameworks we'll consider. I'll show you results that largely relate to uh, the middle and, and this scenario here, okay? So what does that mean? What does this uncertainty do? We've seen how it's shifted the distribution, but how does it shift the outcomes? Well, here, this is the emissions pathway in gigatons of carbon based on the temperature value for different values of XCR. So for different values of the uncertainty about climate damage functions, and for this single scenario about the climate sensitivity uncertainty, Here's what the emissions pathway looked like. So note first that on the baseline case, where there's no uncertainty about uh, the model framework, we start with six gigatons of carbon per year. That's actually low. They're, the planner here is, is, is being very cautious compared to what we see in the data. And they're already concerned about negative climate outcomes. And over time, as temperature increases, they reduce emissions more. As we amplify the amount of uncertainty going from five to one to 0.3, making that XC value smaller, we reduce the emissions more and more because we're more and more concerned about negative climate damage outcomes and we do reduce them more over time as well. What does that mean in terms of our metric, the social cost of carbon we were talking about? Well, here I'm showing you a log social cost of carbon where we're holding economic growth constant. This is really only based on the change in climate outcomes and not the economic framework, because you could just increase output and increase the social cost of carbon just because you have more money to pay. So this is purely based on the economic, uh, or sorry, the climate output 
and you see sort of reverse of emissions that we get pretty significant increases, 20, 30 plus percent more in the social cost of carbon just from the contribution of model uncertainty. So that's sort of one big takeaway that the uncertainty component matters and it can matter pretty drastically, right? Pretty sizable increases in the social cost of carbon. But this goes back to the poll at the beginning, you know, which piece matters and why? One of the advantages of our, our smooth ambiguity framework is that we can open the hood, so to speak, on this uncertainty and decompose which channels of uncertainty matter. Is it the carbon dynamics, the temperature or the economic damage functions? And so to do this, we're gonna decompose this uh, when thinking about constrained uh, minimization, right? So we're gonna solve that minimization problem we've, we saw before, but do it where we constrain it so that we only minimize across certain components, let's say the carbon dynamics, we partition into different uh, components of the model and only minimize over certain parts and leave the remaining partitions uh, on the baseline probabilities, okay? And for just sort of comparison, we're gonna hold fix the emissions trajectories here so that this is the same optimal social planner emissions path that we see across all scenarios. Now, what happens in this framework Here's the contribution to uncertainty coming from carbon uncertainty, the blue line, temperature, the green line, damage uncertainty, and the total uncertainty. So as I mentioned before, the total uncertainty contribution ranges somewhere between you know, 25 to 35, almost 40% of the social cost, cost of carbon being defined by uncertainty, okay? Now, when we think at the different components, what's interesting is that our decomposition shows that while carbon uncertainty matters, it contributes, as well as temperature, the piece that is largest in our framework is the damage function. And I think an important thing to think about is because the damage function has this multiplicative interaction with temperature and carbon, as well as uh, the, the economic framework. And so it's this interaction that makes it really important. It's sort of at the heart of the whole framework of the model, the climate economic model, and feeds on the different pieces. And so the damage function uncertainty from our decomposition is highlighted as being that most significant component in terms of the contributor to uncertainty. Okay, so I think I have uh, very little time. So let me just talk about one last component, uh, just highlight a piece that we're very interested in thinking about, okay? What I've shown you so far has been this very stylized, simplified economic framework with we think interesting climate dynamics and, and, and damage components. But you could ask yourself, you know, there's other components that are going on that matter in the economy. And one of those in particular could be technological change, whether it's, you know, the, you know, TFP related to green production or the ability to mitigate and deal with emissions in the atmosphere. And so one of those frameworks we've started to think about and we've built on that are, are, are in our current framework and actually in sort of a new paper that we're working on, the sort of how should climate change uncertainty impact social valuation and policy is what if you have carbon abatement, okay? And you think about the ability to mitigate emissions. So take that framework we had before and introduce a technology that's quite costly uh, that allows you to reduce the emissions from, from your output in the economy, okay? So I won't get into the details here, but you could think about a costly emissions abatement technology. You make some choice here, we'll call it IOTA, that reduces how much emissions are produced, okay? And importantly, something that uh, we're sort of very new, we haven't really put formally into in, in any working papers yet, we're also thinking about, you know, the ability to innovate and invest in R&D that allows you to shift how productive your abatement could be, right? How much can you reduce emissions, reducing the cost of that? So this introduces both the idea of sort of abatement as well as R&D or, or sort of endogenous investment choices and how does that matter? I'll just highlight one or two really quick results here. I showed you before, again, same kind of story that I showed you, this left panel is emissions and the right one is R&D in developing better carbon abatement technology, okay? I showed you before that the path of emissions as you increase uh, the amount of uncertainty you're concerned about, that brings emissions down. Now, what's unique when you start to introduce technological change in R&D is that yeah, as you introduce uncertainty, right, from red to green to blue, you reduce the emissions, but you'll notice that emissions are higher, right? Some around like eight gigatons rather than six or four. And they're actually increasing over time. Now, why is that? You're concerned about the economy, temperatures are going higher. It's because a planner who thinks that there's R&D available 
even if they're uncertain about how productive or useful that R&D could be, wants to shift their innovation and their, and their sort of policy choices towards that R&D, and they amplify and run up their R&D and, and sort of relatively much more because of that policy tool that becomes available to them, right? And you could see that when you think about, you know, if we thought about distortions, a lot of the big distortions that they're concerned about center on technology change in R&D versus, you know, damages or other pieces, okay? So let me just end there. I think I'm about out of time and wanna save some time for questions. We've thought about model uncertainty uh, and we think it's an important and prevalent component to consider in the climate economic framework. So and we think that there are multiple dimensions of climate economic modeling that are very important to consider. What it does is it leads to an important implication for policy choices. I've highlighted a lot, sort of the social cost of carbon and em emissions and talk briefly that that also has important interactions about technological change or abatement when we think about that. Now, those policy choices are impacted importantly by endogenous equilibrium responses to uncertainty. The planner doesn't just take them at face value, but they adjust based on what's going on in the economy. We use decision theory under uncertainty to guide that endogenous equilibrium response and quantify the uncertainty based on the climate policy choices being made. We've explored and examined different forms of uncertainty and different model components related to uncertainty and tried to quantify those uh, related to climate sensitivity, climate damages, and, and, and technological innovation as well. So I'll, I'll end there uh, and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Michael, for a very, where is it? Okay, I got it. Uh, for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, there is one question from the audience and it's from um, Steve Cecchetti. And um, he's wondering how this um, rigorous introduction of uncertainty could change your prescription for uh, policy action. Um, the example he raises is if you if we put you in charge of setting a carbon tax, how would the inclusion of uncertainty change the level you set? Cool. Okay, so this is a, a really interesting question. Um, let me say it this way: the the sort of inclusion, you know, there are, there are more than there's more than one way to think about model uncertainty. Our framework essentially takes this this idea about being cautious, right? The sort of cautious and waiting for worst case outcomes. So I think the first and foremost thing that we you could take from away from this as a policy prescription that like I would say if I was in charge is that what uncertainty tells us is not that, you know, we don't know what the real outcome is. So let's just wait to see what happens. In fact, that's that's the sort of the opposite of what our response is in this framework. It says, you know, respond sort of early cautiously to protect against realizing worst case outcomes. So I think that's one takeaway from what, you know, this is sort of my opinion and, you know, my co-authors and, and other people might have different views is that uncertainty would suggest that we should respond uh, in a cautious and protective way, right? What you, what, what you don't want to do is wait until the most severe outcomes happen and then try and respond. That can be very costly. And so what the, the modeling framework here would suggest Right, and, and some of the things, uh, you know, let me highlight, when you saw those sort of reductions in emissions, those were all before sort of like the damage curvature realization happened, the jump in climate damages happened, right? And so it wasn't even that there was a, a shift in, in, in damages that led them to be more cautious, it was protecting against potential severe damages in the future. On the other side, you know, depending on the realization of the damages, you, you're gonna adjust your behavior as well, right? So if you realize that the climate damage function isn't as severe, then you wanna sort of pull back on how cautious you are because it's economically costly and doesn't need to be, right? And so I think that's two things that I would say, you know, one is, you know, it would suggest be cautious to protect against severe outcomes. Don't just wait because of uncertainty. And two is that there's an importance to sort of dynamically respond even though the planner here never knows the true model, they let the sort of state of nature that they're in inform their actions, okay? And I think, I think that's important. Just a sort of strict policy that isn't able to respond, I think is overly economically harsh, yet we still want to be cautious to protect against what could be severe outcomes and, and respond, I, you know. So that's sort of my opinion. 
but I think that's what the model informs of, uh, the, you know, that's a good question. Um, I have actually, no, let's go to Pascal with, um, do you think that some types of uncertainty remain more or less constant? For example, economic impact of certain temperature increases while uncertainty of other types like temperature increase, increase over, in, over time. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's an interesting question. Like, do some of them remain constant more or less? Uh, so let me say it this way. That's, there's sort of a couple of ways to think about it. If you look at our modeling framework, maybe I can just share this real quick. Uh, one of the things that the model actually sort of endogenously introduces is, is what does this uncertainty look like? So here's the decomposition across pieces in our framework, okay? You'll actually notice that, you know, as temperatures increasing over time, the magnitude of uncertainty on some of these pieces, it's tilting up a little bit. But for example, the carbon component here is staying quite fixed. Now, why is that? Well, you're getting more carbon in the atmosphere, but the planner's response is actually sort of limiting how much that increases over time. Uh, whereas when you're thinking about the damage function, that piece is going up. So sort of a short answer to your question is, I mean, yeah, I do think there are some pieces that are, are, are more constant, while some of them are varying over time. And in the model, you know, it's actually highlighting that depending on what temperature state you're in, which ones are going to adjust. And it depends on the planner's function. Sort of more broadly, like, you know, is this, uh, you know, when you think about different frameworks, I think it depends. But I do think that some will change over time. Right, and here we're allowing for not always having a resolution of uncertainty, the damage function does resolve, right? So, you know, if the jump is realized, you know how bad damages are. And we think that's interesting because, you know, if you get to two, three degrees Celsius and you start to see that like really negative things are happening, we think it's, it makes sense to say, oh, I'm not, you know, I can rule out some of the damage functions, right? The very sort of best case scenarios, maybe I rule out because I'm seeing really negative outcomes, right? And so that's changing. And it could get worse over time, right? They could get bigger. But I do think there are some more static components and some more dynamic. And I think that's why a dynamic framework is important. Uh, so hopefully that sort of gets at the question. Uh, but yes, I do think there are different dynamic and constant components. I have a question. And it's uh, sort of on an issue that we um, touched upon when um, Stefano Giglio gave his presentation a couple of months ago. Uh -huh. And um, the question was, how do you really model climate change? Do you model it as a one shock the way you did or is something that um, you know, happens year over year, little uh, by little? His uh, concern was that um, you know, it was unclear to him. So I was wondering whether you could comment on why you chose to model climate change as a one, um, as a jump, as a one shot, a sort of, uh, as yeah. a shock, not a one shot, as a shock. Yeah, so let me, uh, so our, our climate damage function, it, it does a little bit of both. So there is, it's a function of temperature, but, you know, most of the action, as you mentioned, sort of only happens after this shock takes place. The, the, the damages earlier on are, are sort of minimal. Um, I'll just, let me be very direct. I don't know. And I think that's important about why we're doing what we're doing. If, if, I, if you just take my opinion, I would say, and the model sort of reflects this, that damages are probably one of the biggest pieces of uncertainty that we have. And it's, I think it's even more than just as it's sort of the year by year or the one shot, you know, is it, we're modeling as like a level effect, right? But, you know, estimates are sort of exist across the board in terms of level versus growth, one shot shocks versus sort of year by year. I think it's a combination of like, you know, that's not a perfect answer, but I think this is the area that we have the most uncertainty about. And there's really great work by guys like, you know, Michael Greenstone and Saul Shang and, and, and you know, Rick Colicito and some of these, like all these people are estimating climate damages. The hardest part about that is, is it's based on historical information. And what we need to know is what happens in the future where we don't have scenarios or, or historical data to show us. I think that's hard. And I think the estimates that we have are doing a fantastic job of trying to give us the best possible picture. 
we just, it's hard to estimate something we haven't realized. And so I think it's a combination. I do think that there are year by year changes, increases in temperature that we're seeing sort of consistently, you know, in different countries throughout the world are, are playing a role, you know, and, and, and these things that sort of felt like one shots where you see sort of, you know, big flooding or, or sea level rise events like high tide in Miami, that's sort of big, are becoming more consistent that they're almost shifting from big one shot events to quite consistent regular outcomes. So I think it's some combination. And, and I do think that incorporating, you know, exploring, let me say this, it's probably hard to incorporate all of them, but exploring all of them is critically important. And I've seen some really great papers that have taken this sort of level approach like we have, and some really nice papers that have done bigger shocks, growth effects, different components. I think we need to explore them all because it tells us which ones matter most quantitatively. Uh, and then, you know, then you can sort of bake them in in an uncertainty framework and say, suppose we have all of these on the table, where do we wait? And, you know, I think that's something we could do even better is allow for different types and then allow the planner in this framework to tell us which ones matter most. Uh, and, and that might be more informative, you know, whether or not each one is happening, which one matters most and how do we sort of make policy robust to that could be important. Thank you. Um, I think Steve has a follow up question uh, once I get to it. Um, well, and um, Rick van der Ploeg raised his hand. Um, Rick, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Oops. Nope. Okay. So um, one last question is um, given the current scientific uncertainty associated with climate change, say for example, with the type timing of tipping points, whose effects cannot be fully anticipated or even understood due to the complexity, can the model provide any guidance on the time path for total global greenhouse gas emissions um, humanity should aim for? Yeah, uh, great question. So you're right, right? So given the, the uncertainty, you know, it's really hard to anticipate what's going, going on. Part of why we put this sort of shock part into the model is because we wanted to get some approach that would uh, help us think about this, right? This question, which is really interesting that, you know, uh, you know, those who have thought about dynamical systems and, and thinking about climate frameworks or, you know, thinking about thresholds and tipping points and shifts in equilibria, we think those are really interesting, okay? The answer I would say is both sort of yes and no, right? I think you can see that we have these optimal emissions pathways in terms of the planner that would tell us like what these pathways should look like if, you know, based on the amount of uncertainty, but it's a conditional statement, right? It's conditional on the underlying model that we specify and the types of uncertainty that we allow for, right? So it doesn't have to be that the model perfectly describes what's going on because if you allow for misspecification, it allows for distortions away from that model, but they're constrained, right? They're constrained about the magnitude and the and, and sort of based on the relative entropy framework. So I think the answer is to some degree, yeah, I think we can give some, some guidance, but clearly that's conditional on sort of how do we, like what types of uncertainty we consider, how do we specify the economic framework? Uh, you know, there's a couple other questions I know I'm missing, but like, what are the policy tools, right? We've introduced here, you can think about it, it's like a carbon tax is really all that's going on. And with the technology change, you know, you're introducing additionally like an R&D sort of subsidy type of framework, you know, depending on the tools you have and the tools you think that are, are, are sort of implementable in practice, uh, which, you know, I think to some degree a carbon tax, to some degree these subsidies can be in play. Uh, that's going to depend on how sort of fruitful these sort of pathways are in terms of informing policy decisions. So I think we can, and I think as we work on getting more and more rigorous and complete models, uh, the better guidance we can get uh, in allowing for sort of as much uncertainty sort of broadly conceived as we can, 
I think that gives us our best shot of giving some information. But you know, I think I want to give an important takeaway to this. I, I don't know that I would take any of the exact numbers or pathways as like this is the right one. I think you should think about this as sort of a distribution of outcomes and how to consider these and incorporate uncertainty. And that's, I think, an important takeaway is that we want to put on the table a, like a menu of, of possible outcomes and distortions and uncertainties and, and allow people, particularly the planner here, but in general, like to think about distributions of potential outcomes and how to respond to that rather than one specific number. Uh, and I think that will help inform policy and an optimal choice, uh, I think, in a more complete way. Well, Mike, thank you very much. This was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I would like to remind the audience to join us again on June 6th for the second webinar in the series. Um, thank you very much. And. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Really enjoyed the questions. I know I missed some. Uh, if you just shoot me an email, I'm more than happy to respond to your questions and continue the discussion. This has been really thank useful for me, so thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.